Okay, uh, welcome to the introduction to ecology. What we're going to do today is quickly go through some of the cycles of matter and energy um, flowing through ecosystems. In ecology, we're really focused on the studying the Earth's populations of organisms. Uh, a population is a group of organisms that live in a particular area, all of the same species. And we're really interested in what happens to these population numbers as they interact with different things in the environment, both living, which we use the word biotic to refer to living, and non-living, which we use the term abiotic to refer to non-living factors. The populations that are in a particular ecosystem, let's say the mill pond out in the uh, um, loop of the Nashua River that we have right on our campus, um, those populations are going to interact with each other and form what we call a community. So a community might include, for example, in this image, the dragonfly population that are in a particular um, watery environment like our pond that interacts with a hummingbird population and a salvia bush population and many other populations of organisms, um, both plants, animals, and microorganisms that live in that particular community. So the community refers to the living things. We're going to add one more layer of non-living things. And the non-living things like um, uh, energy and matter uh, that is drawn into these living systems are going to interact in ways with the living things that are really important. So when we consider both the non-living and the living things that are interacting in the systematic way, we call this an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is the community of living things in a particular area interacting with the abiotic factors in that particular area as well. Matter, we know cycles through ecosystems. We refer to these cycles as biogeochemical cycles because they, the matter is going to cycle through um, non-living areas like the water, but also in living systems as well. Um, the four cycles that we focus on in this class are the, the carbon cycle, sometimes called the carbon-oxygen cycle, um, the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the water cycle. So we're going to first take a quick peek at the water cycle. The water cycle is a familiar one to most. We understand that water spends time in the atmosphere as gas. Um, those gaseous uh, water vapor molecules are going to condense into liquid as they form clouds. Those small droplets are sitting on particles of dust and debris that are in the air. So we can actually see those droplets. They're not quite big enough to fall yet, but when they do get large enough to fall, we refer to this as precipitation. The precipitation has potential fates. That precipitation can run off on the surface of the ground and collect into streams and lakes, which ultimately will uh, drain into the ocean. The precipitation could also sink in and become part of the groundwater or form puddles, which then can be um, uh, then end up in plants and animals as they drink the water. Um, so there's a, a lot of different fates that water can have once it hits the ground. Uh, in our study of biology, we, we are particularly concerned with how the water ends up getting used by the plants and animals. It's called flora and fauna in this particular diagram. Um, and particularly plants and algae that are found mostly in water bodies are going to use the water uh, along with carbon dioxide in the air to produce sugars. And those hydrogen and oxygen atoms that are in the water are going to become part of sugar molecules for a time being while they circulate through living things. The nitrogen cycle is a little more complicated, so I'm going to go a little slower with this one. But the nitrogen cycle is one in which um, we have nitrogen that makes up most of the air, about 70% actually, and that nitrogen is in the form of N2 gas. That N2 is a molecule that's triple bonded, so it's pretty tough to break apart the nitrogen atoms that are found in, in N2, um, but we can. And what will happen is that nitrogen, well, we can't actually. <laughs> um, we, as in the living systems, can. 
the particular living creatures that do have that ability of breaking it apart are bacteria. And it is because of these bacteria that the rest of life exists. Because this nitrogen fixation is what we call this, where the nitrogen gas is broken apart and then the nitrogen atoms are stuck to or fixed to other atoms like hydrogen and ammonia. Um, those nitrogen fixing bacteria make those nitrogen atoms available so that living things like plants can then make amino acids which are needed for proteins. And as you know by now, proteins are critical to the function of um, life on Earth. And although certainly bacteria need to make their own proteins, um, the rest of us can't get at that nitrogen otherwise. So the nitrogen fixing bacteria are going to make uh, these small molecules, I call them, small nitrogen containing mo molecules. And those molecules are now available for plants to take up through root uptake um, and also for algae to take in by absorption when they are in watery environments typically. And those plants are now going to make amino acids, which then are going to be assembled into proteins. The proteins then are available for all the living things to be have access to through food chains. Um, when living things are uh, at the end of their lives, they're going to die, and through their lives, they're going to give off wastes that have proteins in them. These nitrogenous wastes are then going to be decomposed um, by other bacteria, which are going to bring those complex molecules back into the small molecule form. Those small molecules might be taken back up into other plants or into other algae over here in the water. Um, but we also have one kind of bacteria as well called denitrifying bacteria that have the ability to send that nitrogen back into the air to complete the cycle. It's worth noting that fertilizers have a lot of nitrogen in them, and so there can be a problem when fertilizers are um, put onto land masses in uh, high quantities because extra can run off into water bodies, and that extra fertilizer then provides extra nitrogen compounds for the algae that grows in the water bodies, causing um, algal blooms that can cause problems with the balance of those particular ecosystems because it's providing what we call a limiting nutrient that normally keeps the population in check, but when it's ab abundant and available in such supply, it allows the algae to grow. Um, this can happen both in oceans and in freshwater environments like ponds and lakes and rivers. The carbon cycle is one in which, um, for us in biology, we really are focused on this respiration photosynthesis exchange that occurs. Photosynthesis is a process that producers use uh, to take in carbon dioxide and water and produce sugar molecules. Those molecules are molecules that are storing chemical energy. Those um, molecules are then used when the organism needs energy for its various life processes. The life processes um, are going to need to access that in the form of ATP. So what will happen is the living things will have another process called respiration that will convert the chemical energy that's held in glucose to chemical energy in ATP molecules. These uh, respiration processes are going to break apart the sugar molecules using oxygen, giving off water as waste, um, but accessing that energy that's held in the molecules. Carbon dioxide is going to be given off as waste by respiration. So all living things are going to be doing respiration, whereas just our uh, producers or our autotrophs are going to be doing photosynthesis. Once um, that carbon's in the air, it can then um, also be dissolved into water so that carbon dioxide is also available for uh, aquatic plants and aquatic algae to do the same photosynthetic processes. Other things that happen with carbon that we see here in this image uh, that are worth noting is that um, in uh, ocean environments, marine environments, um, there are organisms that have carbon in their shells and their bones. So when they die, they will the shells and bones will um, fall to the bottom of the ocean and build up a sediment. And that sediment is form is going to form sedimentary rock uh, called carbonate rock because it has, has carbon in it. That carbonate rock can be subducted underneath um, the continental plates as plates collide. 
and that subduction can result in volcanoes. The carbon then would be released into the air um, as it is processed through the intense heat pressure that are involved in the volcanic um, activity. Uh, carbon can also be trapped geologically for long periods of time as uh, fossil carbon or fossil fuels we call that, um, like coal and gas. We dig this up and then we burn it and we send carbon dioxide back into the air that way that had previously been trapped for a long period of time uh, under the ground. The phosphorus cycle is pretty simple. It's pretty much in just the soil. Uh, erosion and weathering is going to break up those little pieces and we certainly can have that phosphate that is going to be pulled into plants. The plants are going to use that phosphate to make DNA molecules and what will happen then is that the um, nucleotides that the that comprise the DNA and RNA molecules that are in the plants are then going to be transferred through feeding to all of the different living things that, that participate in the food web. Um, so the phosphate is first pulled up from the soil or by assimilation of algae in watery environments to make those nucleotides and then from there what will happen is that um, the DNA is then going to be disassembled through feeding and then reassembled to make the DNA of whatever creature it needs to be made for. Um, other than that, we have our typical situation where when things die, decomposers are going to return that phosphate back into the soil. The cycles are interconnected as they pass through living systems. Root uptake, we see small molecules being drawn by water, uh, dragging with them the different ions that are attracted to the water molecules, nitrates and phosphates are pulled up into plants this way. Feeding, of course, involves all the macromolecules, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and complex carbohydrates that are transferred containing all of the atoms. All of the different atoms that are participating in these cycles are, are associated with feeding. Decomposition takes these large macromolecules and breaks them down into the smaller molecules that are then available for recycling. If you think about the small molecules that I'm talking about, um, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus are the atoms that make up these small molecules. But we see nitrogen in nitrates, nitrates, ammonia, and ammonium, and nitrogen gas in the air. Carbon we find in many places, um, really in all of the molecules of life. Um, but carbon dioxide is a really important one for us. And then carbonate minerals can be important as well. Uh, for what they provide for shells for different kinds of marine creatures. Hydrogen, of course, isn't found in lots of molecules, but we're going to kind of focus on the water, water vapor. Um, hydrogen is a part of different kinds of acids, so the sulfuric acid and nitric acid that are um, found in acid rain are result from interactions with uh, the hydrogen atoms that exist in the water vapor. Oxygen gas is found also as just pure oxygen gas, O2, but it's also found as part of other molecules like nitrates and nitrites, um, carbon dioxide gas, of course, and all of these gases can be dissolved in both water and uh, in the atmosphere. And then phosphorus we find in phosphate. It's not really found in the air per se. So these molecules are considered small. They're combinations um, that result from covalent bonds between different atoms, um, but what we know is that many of them end up becoming ions as they lose some of their hydrogen atoms in the interactions in, in the world and those ions are going to be important because of their charges because they will be able to be attracted to water. Um, when we think about the larger molecules, the proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids, we can focus on three of those types of molecules as having monomers which are smaller pieces that get chained together in uh, long, long, long structures. Um, they're repeating units. So, for example, amino acids get chained together to make proteins. So the amino acid is the monomer, the polymer is the protein. Simple sugars get chained together to make carbohydrates. Starches, uh, fibers um, are all carbohydrates. And then nucleotides get chained together to make nucleic acids. Um, lipids don't really have monomers per se, although there are components of lipids that are then assembled into the different lipid structures. Energy is a little different. Energy 
does um, go through the systems, but it has a linear flow. The reason why we say that is because it never really goes back to the sun where it originates from. So the electromagnetic energy is going to start from the sun, and then it's going to be pulled in to plants um, where it's going to be converted into chemical energy. Um, the chemical energy is first is found as glucose and then converted into ATP chem chemical energy. The organisms are going to use that chemical energy to accomplish their life processes and then lose most of the energy as heat. If you look here in this image, these red trees are not red because it's fall, but because they are given off heat and this is being taken with an infrared camera. Um, what we know is that the energy doesn't return to the sun, but it is not lost. It just changes forms. Energy, um, like matter, is conserved, which means um, it just will continually change forms. It's never created, nor is it destroyed. Um, you learned about many forms of energy in, in physical science. We're mostly concerned in biology about chemical energy and light energy. Um, although certainly we, we can talk about the kinetic energy and the potential energy in general that are important to life processes. Now what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about life functions? We're talking about all kinds of functions that really are just chemical reactions that um, are interactions with different molecules to accomplish certain tasks that living things need to accomplish in order to continue to exist and to reproduce so their species continues on. Um, all of these processes are inefficient in that they will lose energy in their interactions and that energy comes off as heat. So we convert energy from one form to another in life and an important thing for you to think about is that every step of the way from producers to consumers, consumers to decomposers, we lose heat. We actually have a, an ecologic rule because of this called the 10% rule. And this actually tells us numerically what happens. Only 10% of the energy is passed on from one trophic level to the next. A trophic level is just a group of organisms that are uh, collectively um, looked at because of their feeding habits. So primary consumers are who are eating the producers. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers and tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers. These producers hold on the most energy but only 10% gets passed on. As a result, both the amount of um, biomass and the numbers and the energy contained in the high levels is going to be relatively small because so much is lost as heat. This results in a situation where um, if you have a reduction of available energy at the lowest level, it will reduce the potential for populations at the higher levels. Um, when there is fewer producers, when there are fewer producers, there is less available energy for the top level consumers. And what will happen is those high level consumers are going to be reduced, or in the case of the dinosaurs, eliminated. So poor dinosaurs um, became extinct because they just didn't have enough support in their underlying trophic levels to support their populations. Okay, that concludes our introduction to matter and energy for ecology.